This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Law and Society at the University of Cape Town. This recording is part of a series of seminars entitled Hashtag Thought Leader Encounter featuring leading and emerging academics on law and society in Africa. If you'd like to find out more about the work of the center, check our website at www.cls.uct.ac.za or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at CLSUCT. Thank you. Thank you very much to Popo and Sally. Uh, I have uh, abused my privileges with them, I think, a number of times. Firstly, because uh, the idea for this topic started when uh, I did an interview with them for the South African Crime Quarterly, of uh, which came out in June of this year. There's copies outside my office if you're interested, or you can ask someone from CLS, where we talked about the recent judgment and what that meant for changes in the field of practice around uh, family joining. And so having had a really fascinating conversation and feeling like there was much more to discuss, Uh, I used the opportunity to press my advantage and ask them uh, if they would be willing to do a without law for us. And so they very kindly agreed, and uh, I'm very thankful to both of them for having having done so. Uh, Popo tells me they've agreed to introduce themselves, which suits me fine, because uh, personally I hate being introduced by other people. I find someone reading, you know, some summary of my CV off of a website just really cringeworthy. So that's fantastic. But thank you both very much for being here, uh, and we're looking forward to a great hour. giving the answer can't be a refugee themselves because I can I, I recognize a couple of them in the audience. Can they UNICEF? No one from UNICEF because that would be cheating. <laughs> sir, sir in the nice denim jacket. Do you know what a refugee is or who a refugee is? Um, I think it's someone who's not um, So anyone not born in South Africa but comes to South Africa? Can anyone else try? Yes. Yes? Um, someone who's fleeing from persecution. Perfect. That's one leg of, of, the, de- of the definition. It's um, you're fleeing persecution on account of their grounds Perfect. Okay. We will use these terms interchangeably quite a lot during during our presentation, so it's good that we do a very quick introduction about what an asylum seeker is and what a refugee is. So basically, an asylum seeker is a person who has come to South Africa to seek asylum. Right? They're in the process of seeking asylum. Their claim for asylum hasn't been adjudicated yet by the Department of Home Affairs. And a person who is a refugee, referred to as a formal refugee, is someone who has been recognized as a refugee. It means that Home Affairs has interviewed them and... Based upon these two separate grounds, they've come to a conclusion that they are someone who's left their country because of persecution based on one of the listed grounds, or they are someone who's fled their country because of their events and is going to have to go in war, is an example of one. Okay. Okay. So if you look at the numbers, I would always like to say there's two very important challenges that are facing humankind. The first one is climate change. And the next is forced migration. The number of people who require international protection has not been improving, has not been going down over the years. It has been getting worse. 70 million people are requiring international protection. And if you look at those numbers and you distill them within a regional perspective, you will realize that countries that are the most impoverished or that are have the least resources many of which are in Africa, actually host the largest numbers of refugees. 
there is an unequal or an unfair distribution of refugees across the continent. And what is often referred to as what's called the accident of geography is that if you are closest to, to the problem, you will host the largest numbers of refugees. And part of the challenge there is that there isn't a system of distributing or sharing that responsibility or burden of refugees amongst those countries that are the furthest away from the problem. Okay. What has Africa done? Well, we are both a party to the 1951 Convention and its protocol as well as the 1969 Convention. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what that means, but in a nutshell for you, for your purposes, it means that we have incorporated both definitions of what a refugee or who a refugee is, both in the 1951 Convention and the 1969 Convention, and that's quite important. It's important because Ultimately, what has happened when we enacted our Refugees Act, our law that domesticates our obligation, is that our Refugees Act is hailed by many jurisdictions across the world as, on paper, being one of the best refugee protection frameworks in the world, the most liberal, the most progressive. Because we not only protect people who flee persecution on one of the listed grounds, but we also provide protection to those who are fleeing uh, war in their countries. Right? And furthermore, many other jurisdictions don't have free movement. So refugees and poor asylum seekers in South Africa are allowed to move freely about uh, in South Africa without any restriction. But in many countries, there are camps. They are restricted to camps. People may spend 5 to 10 to 15 years sometimes sitting in a camp, unable to integrate into society. And also what's very important with our Refugees Act is that we allow asylum seekers and refugees to, to access social economic rights, the right to work, Right, the right to, well on paper, the right to access uh, healthcare. And those that are recognized as refugees can even access social security grants. So in essence, the only thing a refugee can't do, or a asylum seeker can't do in South Africa, is vote. That's how liberal our focus our system is. However, the problem lies in the application of the refugee system. There's a huge disjuncture between what the liberal law says and how refugees are actually treated as they enter their, their asylum system. So these are some of the more worrying and depressing problems. The first is simple thing like access to the system. So someone coming to South Africa for the first time wanting to apply for asylum must go to a home affairs office that is designated as a refugee reception office. They must lodge an application. Once they lodge an application, they'll be issued with a, a Section 22 permit. It's an asylum seeker permit. It's got their face, it's got their date of birth, and it's got an expiry date on it. It allows them to access socioeconomic rights, allows them to open a bank account, allows them to work while their application is being adjudicated. This is before someone is able to actually interview them and determine, do you qualify for refugee status or not? Simply getting into the office is a challenge. You'd be surprised and shocked to find out that of the, the few refugee reception offices that we have that are still in operation, people sometimes camp outside the office since 3 a.m. in the morning, and many a time will stand in the line until 4 o'clock when the office closes without being seen. And they will go for a whole week with that happening, without being able to get into an office, just simply lodge an application. And for, for, for most of us who complain sometimes of having to stand in a very short queue to apply for an ID, it's a hundred times more difficult for people to get into the office. Part of that challenge is because, for some reason, the Department of Home Affairs made a decision a few years back to close the Cape Town Refugee Reception Office as well as the Port Elizabeth Office. Both of those decisions were challenged, and they lost. The Cape Town Office was ordered by the Supreme Court of Appeal to open last year in March, still not open. The Port Elizabeth Office was ordered by the Supreme Court of Appeal to open by, I think, last, I don't know, by 2018, or 2016, if I'm mistaken, 2015. It only opened last year in October. Yes, it only opened last year in October. So access is a huge problem. The other one is that there's selective assistance. If you don't have a 20 rand or 50 rand to give or to grease the palms of the security guard who lets you into the office, you may stand there for a whole week without being able to get into the office. Right? And the delays in adjudication is, is probably one of the biggest problems in the system. The law says, very, li very liberal law says, once you lodge an application, that application must be finalized within six months. There are people who have been here since 2000 who have made applications and their applications have not been finalized. That's like writing an exam and waiting 15 years to find out what the decision is. And part of what causes those delays in adjudication is the depressing thing is that there is a top-down unspoken rule within Home Affairs that it doesn't matter how good the merits of your application is, right? 
you may be a young man from the eastern part of DRC who is at risk of being forcibly conscripted into one of the many different militias that are operating within the eastern DRC. Or you may be uh, a young man who's fled parts of Somalia where the Al-Shabaab is quite active. And you come to South Africa and make an application. Your application will be rejected. At the first instance, they always, they've got a 99.9% rejection rate. And this is irrespective of how good your merits are. And then what happens is that these applications then bottleneck with the appeal or review bodies. The Refugee Appeal Board, who's meant to review or who's meant to uh, listen to appeals, has a backlog of 300,000 applications. And they can hear roughly about 120 uh, appeals a year. It will take them about 4,000 years to finalize the backlog. And that backlog was was number that were given to us in 2018. What we do know is that this number has gone up. Right? So, what's problematic is that we've got an amazing refugee protection system, but however, Home Affairs or our state has taken the position that they're going to make it, in my opinion, as difficult as they possibly can for people to get into the system, to remain in the system, and to finally get refugee status, that they're hoping people are just going to give up. And some people do give up. So if you look at the number of people who've lodged applications and on their system appears to have abandoned applications, that number is quite high. Because people, A, can't even get into the office to renew their permit, right? Or if they can get into the office to renew their permit, someone asks them for a bribe. Or when they've given a version of their story which is honest and truthful, which would qualify for them for refugee status, they are rejected nonetheless. And this causes huge problems because we have what the world would view as an amazing refugee protection system on paper, but the people who are meant to have access to that system are not treated with the requisite respect and decency that they deserve. Okay. The theme for many of the CLS conferences and workshops that I've attended is that ultimately what matters is that the law, irrespective of how sometimes it's not implemented as well, it matters. At least having a framework that is in place matters because there are many jurisdictions that don't, even, that don't, that don't have a refugee protection framework. Right? That doesn't spell out exactly what the rights and responsibilities the state has towards refugees. So having the law exists. And we as civil society activists and lawyers working in this space have been able to use the law to fight for the rights of refugees and to defend refugees uh, in instances where we feel that the state is narrowing the space, which is always not easy. And I think part of Sally's uh, presentation is going to be showing you that if you go through all of those hurdles of finally getting that permit, what are the challenges in being able to access those social economic rights that are due to you that this document alleges that you're entitled to? So having law um, that is liberal and progressive has allowed us to slowly and gradually develop refugee protection in South Africa, despite all of the challenges, because refugee law is something that is fairly <coughs> in South Africa, even though we enacted the Act in 1998, but the content and scope of rights, how far do rights extend, is something that civil society has slowly and, de and, and deliberately um, developed through our jurisprudence and through our courts. And, but the difficult part there is that our courts are starting to show strain because a lot of these matters, the courts are being more and more being pulled into this very political and polycentric space which makes them uncomfortable where they have to make these far-reaching judgments around the content and scope of these rights. So far it has been good because the law exists but we're now moving in a very, very terrible direction. So Home Affairs has realized, okay, <coughs> these, these cheeky smart lawyers are using this very liberal law to uphold and to protect the rights that exist anyways because we don't implement the law correctly. So what they've simply done is that since 2008, they've started to introduce some very terrible amendments to the Refugees Act which aim to erode at the content and scope of the rights. I think that discussion is probably well beyond the scope of this presentation, but if it does come up during our discussion phase, I'm more than happy to take you through what some of those amendments are. One of them, uh, most worryingly, is the automatic right to work. So Home Affairs intends to take that right away without any kind of clear policy as to how they're going to take care of asylum seekers and refugees if you take away their right to work. They want to have it on a case-by-case -case basis where they allow them the freedom to work. So if people can't work, it means they can't be self-sufficient. Right? So you then have to have the budget to look after all of their needs. It makes completely no sense. And also they've come up with this idea that they want to build 
asylum processing centers, which in essence we believe are going to be detention centers, which are closer to the border. So people won't be allowed to leave unless they get special permission to leave. If you house people, you're going to have to look after them. Um, the free movement protocol or the free movement aspect of our of, of our refugee protection system would make sense because if you allow people to move freely throughout uh, society, they can integrate and they can be self-sufficient. And I think part of the, the the thinking that we've heard from home affairs is that well, it's for their own good, it's to protect them, it's to ensure that their needs are provided for. But in our experience, and many studies have shown that asylum seekers and refugees are actually self-sufficient. Many of them are employ South African citizens, and many of them run their own businesses. So this whole idea that the, the view or the idea of an asylum seeker or refugee is someone who has their hands out like this is completely incorrect. So the law matters. It's not implemented as well as it should be, but at least there is a floor, a bottom minimum that we can use to advocate for the rights of asylum seekers and refugees. I hope I haven't depressed you too much. There is hope. There are many of us working in this space because it's important for us to be a country that affords people who are seeking asylum, especially in light of our own history where many of our freedom fighters found refuge in many other African countries and were opened and were welcomed with open arms. Now when it is our time to do so, it seems as though we are trying to narrow and close down the refugee space, which to us doesn't make sense. But Home Affairs is of the opinion that we're being overrun. Our borders are being overrun by asylum seekers and refugees, which is completely incorrect. This, the African Center for Migration Studies did a study of the total number of asylum seekers and refugees and migrants in general, generally in South Africa. And by their survey and their best estimates, they estimate that asylum seekers and refugees and general migrants make up only between 3 and 5% of our entire population. It's, it's a tiny number, which, which has a very, very little significance or impact on access to social economic rights of other uh, South African citizens. Where the challenge then is, is that certain asylum seekers and refugees and other general migrants are concentrated in certain parts of the country. Johannesburg is one of them, which makes it appear that they were being overrun. But the numbers simply don't support the position that South Africa is moving in. We don't understand what has informed this new shift, this new paradigm in narrowing and restricting the scope of refugee protection. I'll pause there for now. Thank you. From Scalabrini Centre of Cape Town. We're an NGO that assists migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees here in Cape Town. Uh, we're really grateful to people like Popo and Tisha um, because they help us to litigate cases. Uh, I'd like to start. So, South Africa had a, an amazing researcher who lived here for a number of years and she's since left the country. Um, and she's just recently written a new um, academic paper. And I just want to start with, with something that, that she says. And it's a description. Outside of, migrant process, sorry, outside of a migrant processing area, individuals and families with small children, some of them babies, have set up a makeshift camp. Individuals weaved among sleeping babies, stepping over a Peppa Pig lunchbox, a Mona coloring book, and dwindling stacks of bread and diapers. Fathers doled out powdered milk mixed with water in bottles up to whining toddlers. Mothers strung up underwear on the cyclone fence sides. Left to fend for themselves, these men, women, and children live and sleep outside for days or even weeks as they wait for the chance to apply for asylum. While asylum seekers sleeping outside of refugee reception offices is a familiar scene in South Africa, the account above describes the situation at the U.S. border crossing. I think that most of us have probably seen on the news what's happening in the U.S., but we don't necessarily know what's happening down the road in the CBD at the foreshore. And if you drive there early enough in the morning or if you pass, pass by, you'll see the queues of people there. This picture that has just been painted uh, through that quote, and it's from Ronnie Ahmed who used to be with the African Centre for Migration and Society and is now in Long Island. Um, it's, 
It's a picture that we do associate with refugees, and I just want to be clear from the outset that while I'm going to paint a negative picture in uh, my presentation, uh, one of the things that I have seen time and again in the work that I do on a daily basis uh, with asylum seekers and refugees is resilience. And so I don't want to say that refugees are only vulnerable, um, but that actually they are some of the most resilient people that you will meet. And I'd like that to be taken away more than the vulnerability. Um, so, Popo, thank you for, for your presentation. I, I want to just um, give a couple of numbers as well, and these are from the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee. In 2009, uh, the Department of Home Affairs processed 157,204 um, applications, and that's first instance adjudication. So it's that initial getting an asylum seeker permit. Uh, it's not being eventually recognized as an asylum seeker. So roughly just under 160,000 for the year. Fast forward to almost 10 years later. In 2018, the South African Department of Home Affairs processed 18,104 applications. Um, numbers matter. And those are numbers that are given to Parliament, and so they're useful just in terms of framing what Popo was saying about uh, these pictures that we get in the media of South Africa allegedly being overrun by asylum seekers, which is really not the case. But let's move on to socioeconomic rights for migrants and asylum seekers. Um, so Popo mentioned that South Africa takes an integrated approach, and what that means is that we don't have refugee camps. Uh, we, we want asylum seekers, or initially when uh, our legislation was framed, it was framed in terms of the constitutional rights uh, and freedoms, including the freedom of movement, uh, including access to health and social services. And the integration approach is one that seeks to ensure that refugees are able to live meaningful lives and make meaningful contributions to their host country while being afforded protection by that host country. Um, for asylum seekers, so those people who have not yet been recognized as refugees, they have access to our Bill of Rights. Refugees also have access. And I would put you on the spot like Popo did in terms of definitions. Um, if, if anyone knows where or how someone has access to those rights, can you put up your hand? And I forgive you if you don't. No one? Maybe James, but that's cheating James. <laughs> Okay, so um, the Bill of Rights in Section 7 uh, enshrines the rights uh, that are in that uh, Bill of Rights to everyone. Okay, and you, if, you, if you go through the various rights in the Bill of Rights, some of them say everyone, the right to vote says citizens. So uh, it's, you can see which rights are given to all persons in the country regardless of their nationality. For refugees, it's not only through Section 7, but also through Section 27 of the Refugees Act, which reaffirms that persons recognized as persons in need of protection, so refugees, um, have access to all the rights in Chapter 2 of our Constitution. Um, and there was also a court case about this. Uh, I've framed my, um, my talk, kind of linking it to cases, because we're on the law campus, but um, yeah, if, uh, if they're useful, then please write them down, but if not, um, sorry for being overly legal. Uh, so Tantush, uh, which is T-A-N-T-O-U-S-H, versus the Refugee Appeals Board, uh, said, within our constitutional dispensation, the Bill of Rights is applicable equally to foreigners and hence asylum seekers, as it is to citizens. So access to all the rights in the Bill of Rights that are given to everyone is, is available to asylum seekers and to refugees. Um, but let's, let's look at what that really means, right? So we've got the right to work. Um, once you're recognized, you'd be able to go and seek employment. If you have an asylum permit, you're also able to seek employment. That wasn't always the case. Um, it was a hard-won right uh, through the case of Wachanuka. Um, and Mrs. Wachanuka was, was from Zimbabwe. She had a, um, a child who I believe was uh, a, child, a person with disabilities. And she was in the asylum uh, 
sort of queue, as it were, waiting for her asylum application to be processed. And back then, it wasn't clear whether you could work or study as an asylum seeker. It was a decision that was um, the Standing Committee for Refugees had to make four applications. And um, her case was taken on and it was litigated. And um, what the court said, I think, is, is really beautiful. Um, and I'm just going to find my quote here. Uh, sorry about this. Okay. The judgment states, the inherent dignity of all people is one of the foundational values of the Bill of Rights. It constitutes the basis and the inspiration for the recognition that is given to other more specific protections that are afforded by the Bill of Rights. The freedom to engage in productive work, even where that is not required in order to survive, is an important component of human dignity for mankind is preeminently a social species with an instinct for meaningful association. Um, the reason that I love that quote is because it recognizes that being a productive member of society is something that is intrinsic to all of us as human beings, whether you have fed your country or not. And so work is not just about surviving. Now, one of the practical barriers that we see in the asylum system, and I'm going to come here because it feels like you're all very far away, is... Um, so we've got these Section 22 permits that Popo spoke about. And does anyone here know how long they're renewed for? I think you must know. Like uh, one, two, or six months? Yes. Okay. So one, three, or six months. Uh, that means that, and Popo mentioned uh, the refugee reception offices. There's one in Mussina, there's one in Pretoria. There's one in Durban, there's one in PE, and there's the shell of one here in Cape Town. Okay, but um, in order to continue to renew your permit, you would have to either travel or you can renew at one of those offices uh, for those time periods that Elizabeth mentioned. So if you're someone that is having to renew for uh, every month, um, it would mean having to take time off work every month. Um, it means having to explain to your employer. <laughs> so you have to try and explain the system that uh, is irrational to, to an employer. Ask for the leave time and then go every month and stand in the queue from realistically four in the morning until you are um, allowed to renew your asylum permits. Sometimes, as Popo also mentioned, uh, you're not guaranteed that you'll get that renewal on that day, which means you have to go back the next day. Uh, and that's the limbo that you are stuck in for, and Popo mentioned this, seven plus years. Um, so that's one of the practical barriers to being able to recognize or uh, actually enjoy the right to work as an asylum seeker in South Africa. For refugees, Perhaps it's a bit easier. A refugee certificate, which is issued in terms of Section 24, is usually valid for four years at a time. Um, so you would have to take less time off work. However, um, and I have some redacted copies of both of these documents that people can come and look at after this lecture in case you're interested. Um, the Section 22 permit is now endorsed with a specific rights or ability right to work and study in South Africa. So as an employer, if an asylum seeker came to me and uh, was seeking employment, I could look at that document and it states that they can work and study. Um, so that's a positive, uh, but we've already heard the negatives. For the refugee certificate holder, it doesn't explicitly state on that certificate that they have the right to work and study. Um, and so that, that is a potential barrier because as an employer, you don't necessarily know all the different types of documentation that Home Affairs issues. Um, so that's, those are some of the practical barriers and the brief that, um, that we were given just was to look at uh, what, what the law says and then what the, the reality is. Um, so that's, that's on the right to work. But if we extend um, past just that ability to access work, 
and we look at other types of benefits. So um, linked to the right to work is uh, the right, if you're unemployed, to get uh, UIF benefits. Um, subject to the requirements uh, by the Department of Labor, so you'd have to comply with all of those. But so any employer has to pay UIF for anyone who they employ. But can an asylum seeker or refugee claim those benefits when they become unemployed? Because South Africans can. Um, the second is uh, it's labor rights more generally. So um, if you were to approach the CCMA, would you be able to access your rights at the CCMA simply with your asylum documentation? Um, and so I've got some, some experiences uh, to, to give you on these. Um, so for those who do study labor law, the case of Discovery Health versus CCMA recognized that an employee isn't just someone who is in the country legally. So employment rights are afforded to everyone. Um, but I, I want to say that that's, that's on paper. It's far more difficult to actually access those rights in reality, uh, particularly because it involves physically going into a building where you might be scared because you don't have valid documentation. Um, okay, and then the, uh, just on access in UIF, there was a recent court order this year um, so a practice developed within the Department of Labor where asylum seekers were not able to claim their UIF benefits. So every month, if you're employed, your UIF gets deducted from your, your salary. Um, and employers have to implement that. Uh, and so a number of asylum seekers tried to claim their UIF benefits at the Department of Labor and were unsuccessful. Um, and a case, well, the, the court order basically said that uh, what the Department of Labor has to do is it has to recognize that an asylum permit is a legitimate form of identification in South Africa. Um, and that's quite important because that was February this year. But in 2010, in the matter of Consortium of Refugees and Migrants in South Africa versus ABSA Bank, um, there was an issue with that document being accepted as a valid form of identification. And that was uh, where asylum seekers had tried to, ac uh, tried to open bank accounts and they weren't able to. So Home Affairs' own document is not accepted as a valid form of identification by other institutions. And we sometimes hear, and we try and get it in writing when we do hear, that officials from Home Affairs inform those departments not to accept that document. Um, so those are, are some barriers just in terms of labor rights and employment rights. There are other barriers, and I've got some infographics here that you're welcome to come and take afterwards. Um, so there's the right to education. If you don't have a valid form of identification or a form of identification that is not necessarily recognized as such, then it's far more difficult for you to register your child at schools. So there's an incredible barrier there for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, if you're born in South Africa, are you a citizen? Does anyone know? I know that if you're born in the US, for example, um, then you, you're a US citizen. But in South Africa, yes. No, that's correct. Okay, so... Um, People live their lives. They stand in queues, physical queues. They exist in paper queues for seven to ten to more years. And that does mean that while you're an asylum seeker, you may start a family here. You may want to get married either to a South African or to someone from your home country or someone else. Um, and you have children. Your children are born here they're supposed to get a birth certificate. They don't. So what Home Affairs does or, and is doing is if they do, sometimes they issue a type of birth certificate, but it's handwritten, it's not printed, and it doesn't have an identity number on it. And without that identity number, you cannot 
register on the school system, which is now a computerized system in the Western Cape. It's also computerized in Kapteng. Um, so that becomes a barrier for people trying to access education. Uh, so birth registration, but then the type or format of the birth registration. And it's not just people from outside of South Africa who are struggling to register births. There was a recent case in the high courts in the Eastern Cape where South African citizens didn't have birth certificates and so were denied access to schooling because of that. Um, so there's birth registration. And then uh, the last one that I want to talk about today, and it's something that is becoming a bigger conversation uh, because of recent legislative proposals, is uh, accessing health care. How many people in this room have been to a public hospital? <coughs> okay. Uh, a public hospital here in the Western Cape? Okay, so then you should know that there's like a two-tier system within the public hospitals here, right? Maybe? Okay, so there's city clinics and there's the uh, depart- uh, provincial clinics. Um, I only learned about this recently. And um, it's, it's quite confusing to figure out which one you need to go to. The same applies in terms of like, when you walk into a public hospital, uh, sometimes you are asked for your identity documents, your proof of address, etc., etc. Now, if you go to what the law says, um, they should trust just your spoken word. But they don't. Or they do if you're South African. I recently was at Francisco and it was fine for me, but that's because I I exist in a system of privilege, uh, which allows me to access those services. Whereas uh, for an asylum seeker with this form of identification that is not necessarily recognized, um, it is incredibly difficult. And then there are more barriers in terms of having to overcome uh, types of medical xenophobia that exist. Um, I'm not going to talk too much on healthcare access because one of the experts is over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth is from MSF and, and she's a wonderful resource on both healthcare access at hospitals but also the impact of our prolonged asylum system in terms of mental health. Um, if you exist for more than seven years in a state of limbo, that has a huge impact on your mental and psychological health. And uh, that then has impacts on your physical health. So I'm going to stop there so that we can have a conversation about barriers. Um, please use both Popo and I as resources and let's just try and talk. Um, we'll try and answer questions. or just comments to say? Thank you for all, all this uh, brief you gave to us. Uh, it's incredible. And uh, again, uh, Scrabin and the uh, UCT should be doing a great job in terms of uh, helping the refugees. Sorry, uh, my name is James Pondo. I am from uh, Canon Refugees Community. Uh, you represent the Rwandan Refugees Community living in the capital as well. So as a refugee, I know all these things you've explained to us. Uh, it will never be easy, but as you said, it will have to be decided to be. Sometimes I always explain to people, ask me why I am here, why I do what I do. 
uh, look quite frankly, I would say to them that as long as I'm still alive, uh, physically able, I will try my best to live. And that's a plus to anyone. I mean, what can stop you, what can stop you from doing this and that so that you, you live peaceful? So that's the reason why I'm here. Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's, that uh, was my introduction. My question is, currently we are having a huge problems. Uh, which I can call it the, the loss of our right to ownership. Um, let's say uh, for any refugees uh, who simply own, own a car, it's becoming difficult for us to renew our disk license. And uh, it's crazy. Uh, what the car has to do with me? You know, if I am driving my car, the law requires me to renew its disk on a real basis. And we are getting a huge problem. We cannot renew our disk. And uh, this is causing another uh, huge gap in the traffic department system. Um, if you can see what is happening outside there, it's crazy. I can't tell you what's happening. People are, as I was saying, people are trying their everything they can do to keep their wheels running on the road. And at the end of the day, it's illegal. But you cannot know, but it's illegal. Because someone who owns someone the car, that he or she bought a and he or she is not allowed to renew the license. But what can you do? So they are doing a lot of things to keep that way done. And it's illegal if I put it that way. And I'm sure somehow maybe after five years around the run it will come out and we start to blame people. But what can they do? Can can I respond to that very quickly? Um, James, we're aware of that issue and I'm going to ask you to please see Nandi afterwards um, because it is something that both Scalabrini and UCT are tracking and we do know about it and we've tried to have meetings with the traffic department already but we want to hear about your experience um, so that we can try and do it. So please, please uh, speak to Nandi, um, just so that we can at least get your details, uh, because we are trying to find a solution to that. And just, just to add, our we're as baffled and as confused as members of the refugee community are in this regard, because the document you have is issued by the Department of Home Affairs, but the Department of Traffic says, well, it's not an actual proper figure document. Then, then what is it? Because if you get stopped without it, they're going to detain you. So it just makes no sense why they would suddenly now say they're not going to accept these documents. It makes zero sense whatsoever. But Sally's quickly pointed out it's something that, if need be, we will litigate on. I have a doctor, daughter who come here, she was two and a half years. Now she she's allowed to wait and so on. But I'm still here because I'm not hesitant, so I'm still here for this. Um, she went to apply a job. Now she, this Maroon ID we get. They tell her your paper is not recognized here. Now she she grew up here like like your brother your sister. She grew up here, she don't know anything about where she come from. Imagine that young girl, how is she gonna pay when the paper given by home affairs? The the company they are not recognizing that paper. How is she? Just I I gonna end it. There. I'm 
that Jean Claude, um, I'm going to do something that sometimes frustrates me, but um, it sounds like that's a very specific question uh, related to an individual's experience. And so um, either of us or the organizations that we work for would be help, uh, happy to assist. We would need to know more details, and this is perhaps not the right place to, to share all the individual details. Um, so you can come. I know that I've seen you at Scalabrini before. Um, you're, you're welcome to bring that person to either of our organizations so that we can try to follow up and assist. But we would need to know the individual details and, um, yeah, let's respect that person's right to privacy about it as well in this forum. Okay. Um, it's the individual, it's my daughter, it's my daughter, it's the individual, but it has been the What I try to say is that mm. all of us know this situation, we know what is going on here. You can, and you as a lawyer of refugees, you have to speak to the Home Affairs Department to educate those company employees, to tell them those people we get from Home Affairs how it works. That is what I try to say. Some people they are, and some companies they accept, another they are not. Means they something they this. I mean, that's the thing. A good take home point for us. I mean, just for context, before I started working at the Refugee Law Clinic many years ago, 2013, whenever it was, I had never seen an asylum seeker permit in my life. I had no idea who a refugee was. And what we do notice, what we see on a daily basis, is that I, at least once a week get a call either from a university or a college or an employer or someone wanting to find out, we've got these permits, what are they? Can we employ people? Can they work? Can they open bank accounts? Uh, they've told us they're struggling to extend their permits. Can you clarify what the position is? There is a general lack of understanding amongst society in general, whether it's sometimes government departments themselves or even schools who say, no, no, it's not a permit. Go get a work permit. Go get a study permit. So people don't know. It might be that we need to intensify and strengthen our own advocacy uh, efforts in trying to get more members of the public to understand who are these people, why are they here, and what permits are they on. It does take time, it does take resources, but it's something important that you've highlighted that we we will do our best to focus on. Aiden, you look like you've got a question. Oh, um, I believe uh, if I heard you correctly before, how this, how this is fair enough now. Um, you were you were stating that um, people are born actually while they're going through this asylum process. People are born without birth certificates or identity cards, and you touched upon this idea that, like in South Africa, it's not just being born here which grants you citizenship. I'm not familiar with surrounding countries' citizenship laws, but I do know in some places you do need to be born there in order to. I mean, is the South African government effectively making people stateless? Um, so, you, you can apply for citizenship uh, if you are born here and, very broadly, if you're born here and have been here, for, uh, you can apply when you're 18. Um, so you'd have to remain here for that long. There is um, a case about this because it, there were changes to the citizenship legislation. And the case is called uh, Miriam Ali. Um, and it was about Home Affairs, um, the way that Home Affairs interpreted the changes to the Citizenship Act. Uh, and they were saying that it would only apply to people who were born after the amendments, uh, which would mean that uh, people would be able to apply for citizenship after, sort of, I think it was 2032, but I, I don't remember the exact um, year at this stage. That case... Um, was successfully litigated by the Legal Resources Center and they got a good judgment in the Supreme Court of Appeal. And this was not last year, but the year before. Um, I stand corrected on the exact date. But um, we have recently heard that Home Affairs once has applied for leave to appeal that case, but they're, 
very much out of time. There's a set amount of days in which you can apply for leave to appeal, and they're a year out, more than a year. Um, so it's it's something to watch. Um, they've applied to the Constitutional Court for that, and uh, there are um, implications for the way that they want to interpret the law or how, how they argue, but the courts have... Um, have categorically said, no, that is not the interpretation that is correct. So, uh, if applied, and there is this disjunction, then there is less of a risk of statelessness. Um, but that's if applied. And I, I don't know if James wants to add, because I know UCT has been doing some work on, on this as well. So, technically, our laws provides that <coughs> if a person would otherwise be stateless, then the state can grant Citizenship. So there, there are safeguards, but as as does happen, the the, the, the practice sometimes is quite far from the reality. Um, so that's also uh, yeah. But uh, we we're waiting on uh, hopefully a, a a refusal from the constitutional court in Miriam Ali. Um, I do have a question, if I may. Um, I just want to tie off uh, Aiden's question around the birth certificate. I think Sally had mentioned it earlier. What's also important to note is that those handwritten birth certificates that are issued to foreigners or asylum seekers are terribly problematic. Any South African citizen or permanent resident who has a child here in South Africa will be issued with those uh, birth certificates that are printed by a machine and I think it's, it's, it's on a piece of paper this size. If you lose it, you can go to any home affairs because it's registered in the system and you can have it printed out. Those handwritten ones, if there's an error on it or if the father wasn't there, their details weren't captured on the birth certificate, you can never add them on. If you lose it, you have to go back to the exact same home affairs where you initially applied for it. Someone has to go look at the folio now, but you still have it, and go to a strong room somewhere and find the book, page through the books. So if you applied for it in 2008, it's going to be a mission for the person to go find, and they just never do it. They tell people to go away. So I have no idea why they created this parallel system where they just gave birth certificates that were handwritten to foreigners, as opposed to just giving them birth certificates. And you will hear the line by Home Affairs in most of the media channels. They always say, oh, there's people here that are undocumented. They don't want to come forward. People do want to be documented because it makes no sense not to be documented. Without documents, you can't have access to rights. So people want to get documented, but they create all of these barriers and side peril things that make no sense whatsoever. Because all you're doing is making more work for your own home affairs officials if someone has to go look for this random document. Just have it on the system like you do for, for, for South African citizens. It makes zero sense. Yes, James? Uh, yeah, just building on what, what Popo was saying as well. It, it affects at all levels because when you need to get a death certificate if you have an expired or no permit, the same problems arise. You won't be issued with one. You can't bury. This is another problem that we've had. So it's, it's at every level. My question is to, to, to both of you is just, you know, we, we see that there's a disjunction between what the law says on the one hand and practice on the other hand. If you could isolate maybe two or three things that need to happen in terms of sort of practice and policy that will bring practice in, in line with the law, what would they be? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> For me, if I, if I just pick one, for me, the biggest challenge in our asylum system is with the quality of the adjudication process and the delays that come with it. So, in essence, what our refugee system is now, it's a lottery. Depending on which office you go to, which official you meet, whether you have the means to grease palms, you may or may not get refugee status. And part of the complaint of home affairs is, oh, there's a whole bunch of economic migrants that are are abusing the system. They're coming in through the system of the asylum system because you don't have to pay to get an asylum seeker permit. And with this lottery system, you can be on here for 12 years before Home Affairs actually interviews you and determines, actually, no, you're an economic migrant, right? If they adjudicated applications fairly, transparently, and those that deserved asylum got asylum within a short, relatively short period, then it wouldn't be this as lottery where people take chances and try to get into the system. And you wouldn't have any of these problems where people are in the system for many, many, many years. So create a system that's clear, that's transparent, that's fair, and that's efficient. Then you will solve many of the problems that we have with the refugee system. It starts at that simple level of just having a proper quality adjudicative system. So I, I mean, I echo what Popo has said. I think the quality of the status determinations is atrocious. 
Um, I would also look at because that quality would would apply if we if we were magically able to change that. That would apply to people coming into the system now, but we're still stuck with everyone who's already in the system. And so, uh, looking at backlogs, and we know that there is um, a process in place to look at the backlogs before the Refugee Appeal Board. There are also backlogs um, before the Standing Committee for Refugee Affairs. And so, uh, looking at potential group determinations, where that determination would be positive, and there'd probably be a way to isolate um, certain groups that can be positively determined in in those backlogs. I think that that would uh, really assist with uh, with the backlogs at SCRA and at the RAB level. Um, and then uh, just implementing the law as it is would be incredible. <laughs> it's a low bar. Um, so, yeah, that would be great. I would also say, and this links to what Papa said about um, the use of the system by people who don't fall within the convention grounds. Um, we're not going to stop migration. We're not going to stop the movement of people in the SADC region uh, and in South Africa. And I think that the sooner that the government realizes that and plans for it, the better. And, I mean, South Africa was built on people who are on the move. Um, and that's people who are on the move domestically, but also regionally. Uh, and so I would say that we need to look seriously at a regional static low-skill migrant visa. Um, it's mentioned in the National Development Plan, uh, one of the white papers, uh, I think. Um, and yet there's kind of no movement on it. But that would hopefully take a lot of the stress off the the refugee system because it would reroute a lot of people who might be using the system as an unofficial work permit system. Um, thank you for the presentation. My first question is, what is the difference between the permit that is given to the asylum seeker and the certificate that is given to the refugee as a result of the recognition. I've listened to the differences, or let's say the similarities. I think the similarities are just um, the renewal. So you renew the permit, you also renew the certificate, right? And my second question is, um, can I call it hierarchy or status? So say, as a refugee, you're applying for scholarship. And most scholarship, the conditions are, okay, say, 50% for... South Africans and permanent resident um, holders, and maybe 25 percent to temporary resident holders. Um, what is the debt status of refugees? So are they classified as permanent resident holders? Sort of. I'm not sure if you understand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, with a refugee certificate it means that you have been recognized as someone who is in need of protection by the South African government. Um, the asylum seeker permit means that you are still trying to get that recognition. So you are still seeking recognition. That's, that's the, the difference just on that. And then there's the time periods. Um, someone who has a refugee certificate, so they're a recognized refugee, they have, in, on paper, um, they are entitled to all the same rights as a South African citizen, except the right to vote. Uh, so, for example, if, if a recognized refugee were to apply for a social grant, a uh, child support grant, old age grant, etc., as long as that refugee has um, a refugee ID, which they would have to apply for, they are entitled, they, they can apply for that grant. And um, the same tests would have to be done as are applied to South African citizens who apply for those grants. Asylum seekers are not allowed to apply for that grant. This one grant that, has, that asylum seekers have been successful in applying for in very, very specific circumstances, um, and that was in 2008 during... Um, the xenophobic violence that happened that, that asylum seekers were also able to access grants. 
or a specific grant, but but for the rest, asylum seekers are um, on their own in terms of getting government assistance, whereas refugees um, on paper are in, entitled to more. One of the things that I, I didn't mention, but which we are seeing, is... Um, so refugee certificates are supposed to be um, renewed every four years. Uh, we're seeing that some of them are now starting to renew for only a period of six months. When that happens, uh, the certificate holder cannot apply for a refugee ID. And as I said a few moments ago, you need a refugee ID in order to apply for a grant. Um, so there's another barrier that... Um, I could I could stand here all day and give you barriers, um, but that's that's one that we're identifying in terms of um, access to to scholarships. I know that HCI Foundation specifically uh, gives scholarships to refugees, but I agree with you that um, often and I think maybe it's as a result of not understanding uh, who a refugee is. Many of the bursaries and scholarships available are not necessarily open to uh, to refugees. Um, it's, yeah, perhaps another area where, where more advocacy is needed from uh, various refugee organizations, um, which is not the perfect answer. I think you need to look out for around tertiary education is that what we've been able to do quite successfully this year is lobby and advocate with a number of colleges and university institutions around leveraging the same rate for that they do for South African citizens for refugees as well. Because in some institutions what used to happen is that refugees used to be charged um, external, international, international rates and had to pay fees up front, which just didn't make any sense because in essence what happens when you become a refugee is that that host country envelops you with its protection and the benefits that come with it. So it makes no sense for them to charge you as an international stu uh, student. So we get a lot of these requests and questions from admin and HR from various places. They ask, should they be charged as, as international students? And the answer that we always give them is no. So if you can't get a person, at the very least, they, they need to charge you local rates. Just to follow up, I think also, can you just about when do they go from refugee to once once you've been a refugee for um, so once you've been recognized as a refugee uh, and received that certificate uh, once you've been that for five years you are entitled to apply to the standing committee for refugee affairs uh, for certification in terms of Section 27C of the Refugees Act. Um, our shorthand for it is Section 27C certification. And what that means is um, you are asking the Standing Committee to recognize that you will remain a refugee indefinitely. The Standing Committee doesn't only have backlogs for reviews. It also has backlogs for Section 27C um, certification applications. And so um, I, I started, I mean, I, I started interning first at um, UCT Refugee Rights Unit when I was a student here. I then went on to work at Legal Resources Center and now I'm at Scalabrini. And in that time, I would say that the number of certifications that I have seen from SCRA is less than 20. Um, so I don't see, or I haven't seen a lot of those, and that's been uh, since kind of 2012, 2013. Um, perhaps Popo may have seen more. Um. I mean, they've, they've gotten better over the years. You used to make an application for certification, which maybe if we take a step back, that whole process to me, is absurd. it does seem a bit absurd. So you want the standing committee to look at the reasons that go to here and decide and look into a magic ball and say, it, it looks like you're kind of going to be a refugee forever. What they consider, what they look at, what even indefinitely as a time period kind of looks like for them. Are they looking maybe the next two years, next three years? It makes no sense. We made the application, some of them are successful, but it's really a toss-up as to what they really consider as someone... 
someone who's going to be in a situation of refugees um, for in, an indefinite period. But what that also does, it just makes more work for themselves. Why not just say, if you've been here and you've been a refugee for five or six or seven years, after that seven year period, you automatically qualify to become a permanent resident. Why must you then come back to us and apply and us process this whole new application? It makes zero sense. If you've been here for six, seven years, you, you, sh- you should be given permanent residence. I mean, what, what prospects would you possibly have of going back to your home country and rebuilding a life after you spent so much time here and you have roots here, you've married here, you've got children here? And I do understand the international principle around refugee protection is that it's meant to be temporary. But the, the real world practical realities is that people don't just sit around for seven years and do nothing. They continue on with their lives. And you've got to find a way in terms of what the 1951 convention says is that you've got to allow people to naturalize. They've got to move away from the state of limbo. You don't know when your permit is going to be, is going to be taken away. You don't know when if you're ever going to be um, extended. So you've got to get people out of this psychological limbo that they suffer from and, and let them naturalize. So yes, you can go from an asylum seeker to a refugee to a permanent resident. And if you then hold that permanent residence for five or ten years, you can then become a citizen. But you it's have a- to, again, I mean, once you get the 27C certification, you have to apply for permanent residence. Yeah. Once you're granted that, then you would have to apply for, for naturalization. Um, <laughs> and just to say, if you are on any other visa regime, let's say you're here on um, a work permit and you're here for the set amount of time, and again, I think it's five years, um, you can apply for permanent residence. So the parallel system under the Immigration Act uh, is very unequal to what um, recognized refugees face after recognition. I'm not even talking about the years that they are here um, prior to being recognized. I heard an interesting term recently, which was asylum seeker refugee. Um, which was used uh, to describe uh, the people in South Africa because of the prolonged status determination process that people are subjected to. have a question and perhaps maybe just an observation from the numerous examples that you have mentioned and from the two gentlemen in front is that there seems to be a disconnect between the law and what the government does in practice and particularly it seems that also it's a very deliberate thing it's not um, it's, 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 it's not by accident so my question is what is the reason behind that is the is the, is the government undecided on their policy on migrations and what to do with immigrants and refugees and so they are they try, just trying to cover it up by saying oh no we'll pass a law where we'll seemingly, it will seemingly look like we're protecting refugees but in practice we'll try and frustrate them and keep them in the state for whatever reasons that they have and like, what is the conversation happening around that um, this particular conversation do you understand I mean, for me, I, and the views I reflect don't reflect the views of the UCT refugee group. They are all my, they're my own personal views. In essence, this is the, the stance. From, from what I've been able to look, by looking through parliamentary questions that are posed to the Minister of Home Affairs in Parliament, looking through policy documents, white papers and green papers and this, in a very crude and crass way, the South African government if they could, would say, we don't want foreigners here, we don't want refugees here, but they just can't. The manner in which they treat immigrants in general leads any rational person to that conclusion, that you are not welcome here, right? And Sally touched on it when she said, we've got to start looking at migration differently. People who are foreigners, I don't think there's any person who's a foreigner on this planet, but people who are here not born in South Africa should not be seen or viewed by the state as a threat. And that's, that, that, that thinking and that discourse is now starting to influence the manner in which we approach migration. Because if you look at the white papers and green papers, they talk about this whole securitization approach, that we need to be stiff on our borders, militarize our borders. And there's no empirical data at all to support that policy stance that we're being overrun by migrants. The other one is, oh, they're, they're putting a burden on our socioeconomic system, our, our social basic services. No data, no data is there to support that. So, 
the powers that be that sit up there to make the policies clearly are on a mission to make South Africa a bureaucratic and administrative nightmare such that people don't want to apply for immigration permits and those that have applied for asylum seeker permits just merely give up and go away which is it makes zero sense because Sally correctly pointed out people have been migrating for years people are going to come to South Africa if people are faced with an option of do I do I brave the Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia or do I stay in Cameroon now when there's a, they're on the brink of a civil war between the north and the south because the south wants to secede or do I stay in the eastern parts of DRC, where I'm at risk of either being forced to be conscripted. If you're a woman, it is the rape capital of the world. Do I stay there or do I come to South Africa and live here undocumented? Any rational person is going to come here. If you don't give me a permit, I'm going to stay here either way because it's a life and death situation. Where I'm fleeing is much more dangerous and worse. So they're thinking, let's make it hard, they're going to go away. People are not going to go away. Rather, document people so you know who's here and give them access to be able to work because I I will repeat this. Migrants don't come here on their knees and do this. They make a plan, like the gentleman said. They live, they work, they start businesses, they employ people. They are very resilient people, like uh, Sally had said. I don't know where this whole thing of, let's make it difficult for them, maybe they'll go away, comes from. It's misguided and is not influenced in any way by law. I'm not stopping you. I have a question. Do you think it's any different than the way that the South African government treats vulnerable people in general, though? So, you know, I work in violence against women, right? And the story that you're telling about papers and handwritten things and books in the back of rooms is verbatim what happens in the domestic violence protection order system, right? So we make it as hard as possible for people to get protection from the state. I agree with you that I think migrants are reserved for a special kind of hostility from the South African government. But I think there's something we need to think about about the way in which our state provides services or doesn't, or doesn't feel accountable. Because in the same way, the Domestic Violence Act, the Sexual Offences Act, the police send you from there to there, the court send you from there to there, the no one serves your order, the paper, there's no photocopier toner, or, you know, the police van only has three wheels. I think we need to think a bit more, I mean, I'm not even joking. <laughs> I just, I think there's a bigger question here sometimes. I think we, in, as advocates in our spaces, we get so, we get so familiar with the, with the problems that we're trying to press against that I think we sometimes forget to step back and say there's a commonality here and that, that there's maybe something at a, at a bigger level. I don't know, something I'm really thinking about in my own world. But sometimes I think it depends from cause to cause, but, I'm going to try and say this with, without putting my foot in my mouth, but <laughs> if I'm frank, refugees and their issues isn't a sexy topic that the media writes as often as they should about when they're, when they're um, violations of their human rights. They will write long paper, I mean, they'll write long articles on if they bust four Nigerians who've been selling drugs somewhere, right? They'll write those they love, but they won't write long, lengthy articles around what's been happening but in the Cape Town Refugee Reception Office. So in order to get people riled up and pissed off about refugee issues is, di- is difficult. And I was hoping that this movement around getting people really angry and pissed off around domestic violence against women was going to gain momentum, but it's kind of fizzled out. But how do we get people to realize that the government is the government, but we have the power and they are accountable to us and we need to be more pissed off about what they do in, in not just as a social media fan, but to do it over a prolonged and sustained way in order for them to realize, actually, if we don't perform here, we're, we're not going to go anywhere. And part of the challenge is that I think South African citizens are, perf- are performance inelastic. So no matter how much our government abuses us, we always vote for them. And there's no incentive for them to take our demands seriously because they know they're in. And that, and that democratic system then is broken if it's like that. If there is no accountability, your accountability can't be every four years. Your accountability has to be every single day, every single hour your government must serve you. But I, I do take a point around seeing how do we galvanize our different causes you know, in a way to amplify our voices and see the commonalities in the barriers. It's a very good take home question. Response to that kind of, it's kind of like when you, it's like yelling into a vacuum. So eventually you're going to yell, you're going to yell, you're going to be mad, you're going to be scared, frustrated. But if you're yelling into a vacuum and no one is listening to you, 
that anger is going to manifest in, like, it's just going to fester in yourself, or it's going to, like, internalize it, and you're going to, like, it's going to psychologically mess you up, um, speaking from experience. Um, but you see it in all of the structures, even in this structure, is Kramer. You can complain, you can be angry, you can be so angry, you can be on the brink of, I mean, pretty much anything. Um, and if your, if your grievances or whatever it is, your experience is dismissed, you're just going to be angry and you're going to end up broken. So I think as much as I'm like pro getting everyone angry and pumped, it's, I, I don't know if it's even that helpful because like with the gender-based thing, people put many posters like, less toxic masculinity, more toxic by Britney Spears. Like that's not helpful. She was very angry, I'm sure. But like, guys, revolution. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, just on, on Kelly's point, I think that one of the things that's, that is necessary is to perhaps look at, um, at how <coughs> we're working in silos. Um, I think that it's, it's easy to, uh, to talk about the interconnectedness of struggles, um, but yeah, looking at how we work in silos, looking at, at the interconnectedness of struggles, and also looking at who we target our anger or um, actions toward. And, you know, um, if, if I got angry at the uh, ground level official at the refugee office, it's not going to achieve systemic change. In fact, that ground level official has probably seen 120 people on that day and is tired and probably has to go home and uh, you know, look after their children or whatever. And so um, I think that finding a strategy to target the right people, not just in terms of who we vote for, but but also just in, ter uh, in terms of accountability is, is really important. And um, I don't have all the answers, but I think that uh, part of the pathway to finding those answers is not working in silos, figuring out strategies for targeting the right people. Now we've got one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking more just back on the freedom of movement idea. I just want, I, I think I missed it in the clarifying the distinctions, but I just wanted a little bit of clarity on what an economic migrant is. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is just, to me, like, there's a unifying thing if we can, it's potential, okay, as as you try to, like, create a solution, like, that's what I'm, I'm quite solution-oriented as a person, otherwise I get quite frustrated, um, and try to, like, visualize what it might look like, right, what we're trying to, what the ideal would be, and then work backwards from there, like, what steps need to be taken. So, um... So I, I think about maybe the EU as an example, and you know, his, historically, if you're linked and tied to other states, um, and freedom of movement is imperative, then ten, conflicts tend to like maybe be more difficult. I don't know how that would work in a pan-African context, but like that's kind of what I was thinking about. Like there are talks about maybe creating a free trade and a free work environment across the continent and do we see that as something that Africa is ready for, South Africa is ready for like yeah, that's something that that, yeah <laughs> well we were supposed to have uh, an African passport by the end of 2018 <laughs> we, we still don't but have you one you don't have one? I have one <laughs> <laughs> Um, part of the fear around creating an economic hub in the SADC region, ECOWAS does it, it does it, do it very well. If you live within the ECOWAS region, you can move and work easily. South Africa, I believe, when I've been in parliament and we presented on this particular issue, believes if they create that kind of hub in SADC, everyone's just going to come here. Because then, what other options do migrants have? Do they go to Bots, which is really tiny, there's more people in Soweto than there are in Botswana? Do they go to Zimbabwe, no, because the economic situation and the political tension there is quite terrible. Do so they go to Malawi? Malawi has an incredibly 
uh, stressful economic time as well. They just think if you allow people to move freely within the Celtic region, everyone then is just going to come here and it's going to be a burden on us. So I think we're a long, well away from having a regional free movement framework that actually works in the Celtic region. Um, I am a proponent of free movement, but how it works in reality where there are differing economic climates in the region is, is problematic and it's something we need to think, I think, quite clearly about. Um, but, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I can't take any further than that. Um, just to answer, economic migrant, I prefer just to use the term migrant, but economic migrant is a term that is often used in the media and by governments, and it's, it's someone who moves for economic purposes. Um, so they're, they're moving across a border often, but it can also be internally, um, for a job, for example. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's probably easier and more useful to simply use the term migrant as distinguished from, uh, for example, refugee and asylum seeker. Um, but, I mean, I could... Yeah, uh, an asylum seeker and a refugee, they're both um, also people on the move. They just have specific protections that uh, international law, regional and domestic law um, afford to them as well. But, but I think it was also coming back to the, to the work in silos, like uh, if we look at health and mobility, the work more in health, yeah, we have the focus for, for migrants, but, but if we really look at the South African healthcare system, then we also see that there's a lot of barriers in terms of internal mobility and getting access to care. So we have to be careful when we advocate, for instance, for you know removing the barriers for international migrants that we that we're conscious of that of that reality that it that is. And I think it's a, it's it's yeah being conscious about it and the way how you then advocate, like taking those messages along rather than alienating maybe sort of part of the of the population. Uh, um, and then, yeah, it was more on accountability um, and, and is it deliberate? I think, yes, uh, probably part of it is, is deliberate and to, to, to frustrate people um, and, and, uh, and that there's policies who are, are de deliberately making it difficult for people. On the other hand, I think as well, and I've, I had heard that uh, when the law was created, uh, that the, actually uh, there was not, um, the institutions to implement the law were not uh, created uh, in sense or oh, given the capacity and the training and I think today we still see a lot of that as well that it's not only the politicians who have probably their agenda but I think there's also a problem with the uh, institutional capacity and accountability of those institutions which is which also, also very harmful so, yeah. I think we're wrapping up right my, my parting comment to help close this discussion is that we, we could we could fix all of these problems but ultimately what I want to see I want to work myself out of a job right I don't ever want to have refugees right so it's all good and well to have a refugee system that maybe one day will work but if we do not take a hard look at the reasons that cause people to flee then we're never ever going to be able to do our job we don't want people no one ever wants to leave their home so we've got to as we lobby for change in this system, but we've got to also lobby our politicians to take a more stern approach in their diplomacy, in ensuring that dictatorships don't run for 40, 50 years, right? To ensure that there are enough peacekeeping missions to ensure that people don't have to flee their homes from war and persecution. So we've got to deal with, yes, when people are refugees, look after them, but we've got to ensure that they don't get pushed out of their homes to begin with. And that's the only way that we're ever really going to resolve this refugee crisis that we're having. I think my parting point would just be that um, migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers are a net positive for the South African society, and not just South Africa, but regionally as well. Um, I've started being interested in the impact that uh, remittances have mm -hmm. in a region, and um, if we 
ensure that people have access to their social economic rights here, whether you're uh, whichever status you're on. Um, if money is being sent home, money is also being spent here. But that money that's being sent home helps to stabilize things there as well, which then feeds into what Popo just said about how we need to be outward looking in terms of our policy positions and stabilizing regions so that uh, we address the root causes of at the very least why people become refugees. Thank you very much. So, just a, a quick word of thanks from me to both Sally and Popo as always a wonderful talk that could have probably more appropriately gone on all afternoon. Um, thank you to all of you for coming and my parting shot is like and follow us on Instagram which is I hear what all of you know the kids today are doing and Facebook for all of the older people like me uh, that's where you'll hear about our next events one of which is the can you unspeak lawyer advice assembly for next week which is in the here in the moot court right so we've got colleagues from Ndifuno Kwasi coming to talk to us about how we talk to communities about uh, about legal terms, terminology, processes, advice, and it's sure to be a crackerjack event. So please RSVP because otherwise, you know, the lunch police don't want to give you lunch. But uh, we hope to see you next week. Thank you.